So I'm taking a break from John today, but I'm going to be speaking on something that comes out of John, because in Jesus' prayer, he prays specifically for the unity of the body. And one of the aspects that I'm going, of breaking bread together is unity in, the, in what we do to remember Jesus. And so my title today is Bread and Wine, the Body of Christ United. Bread and Wine, the Body of Christ United. And my goal is to explore the richness of breaking bread together, especially as an expression of unity. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, go over seven reasons for breaking bread, then talk about the importance of shared meals, and then end by looking at one body in Christ and how this relates. So why do I not call this communion or Lord's Supper or the Eucharist? Why, why do I persistently call it breaking bread? Well, if you look at all the scripture references to the, this, this event, then uh, I've catalogued how many times each one comes up. So 12 times it's referred to as breaking bread. Once as the Lord's table, once as the Lord's supper, once as a love feast. Once, well, it's, it's communion, but it's not naming it communion, it's saying it is communion happens through it. Or participation is another translation of that same word. Then there's the word Eucharist, which is used in some Christian traditions. Eucharist actually just means giving thanks. So, for example, the the um, leper who was healed from Jesus, one of them came back to Jesus and gave thanks, Eucharist. Um, on the other side, the Pharisee in the temple who was praying, who saw the, the tax collector, said, thank you God that I'm not like this tax collector. That's Eucharist. And many times Eucharist is used of blessing food. Before you have a meal, you do Eucharist, which is blessing food. And one time it says that Jesus does this when they break bread. And so that's how it's got connected, because it's in the same context. But really it's not a good word, because Eucharist is what we do every time we give thanks for a meal. So, breaking bread is what I'm going to call it. Seven reasons for breaking bread. Just every year ago I gave a, a message on the seven reasons for breaking bread, and I'm sure you don't remember that perfectly. For those of you who do, you can just switch off for a minute, but I'm going to go over these seven reasons fairly quickly. And we're going to be picking up on one of them for our sermon today. Looking backwards as we, we remember Jesus' death. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 it says, when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So quite clearly Jesus talked about remembering what it, it, he did. And what does that mean? It means quite simply remember, not to forget, to, to, rem to bring it to mind. So the second is to proclaim what he's done as a witness to others. In uh, the same passage in 1 Corinthians it says, for as often as, often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. How can it function to proclaim? Well, people um, at the time wondered why Christians spent so much time in each other's houses, eating together, and they were impressed by the kind of love and community that they had. And this community, particularly expressed through breaking bread together, um, naturally led into an explanation of what Jesus had done. And so it was a very natural way of describing the gospel because we didn't, they didn't have the privacy that we have in our homes of eating. You know, there would be doors open to the street and people would know what they were doing. It would be quite well known. Um, in fact, even recently I was, uh, I was watching a lecture by an archaeologist who had excavated 
a Roman house that was used as a church. And he was so impressed that it showed that, the, that Christianity at that time involved every strata of society from slaves to the wealthy all coming together in unity. And this impressed him and he said, no wonder it grew so quickly, no wonder Christianity grew so quickly because none of the other religions of the day did that. And so even today it's preaching that message from what they did in those times. So proclaiming it as a witness to others. The third thing, to demonstrate our unity in Christ. I'm going to be talking about that shortly. The fourth, to celebrate that our sins are washed away. The Passover, which this re uh, replaces, the Passover was to celebrate freedom from slavery, um, freedom from the oppression of the Egyptians. And we don't have to be good. We, we're not trying to earn breaking of bread by being good enough. We're remembering that we already have the freedom that Christ has got for us. So it's celebrating what has happened in the past. The fifth thing is to obtain a blessing as by faith we receive the benefits of Christ's death. So I'm just going to say um, very briefly that there are kind of two extremes in Christianity. One would say you automatically get a blessing from doing it. Whether or not you're thinking about something else, you know, whether or not you even believe, you get a blessing and you get your sins taken away actually at this event. The other side will say, no, it's just a symbol. It's just picturing something. Well, I think it's something in between. We don't magically get a blessing, yet God has promised that if we obey his commands, there will be blessing. And so as we do this, obeying Jesus, following what he told us to do, there is an impartation of joy and particularly, I think, of assurance and a knowing and appreciation of what God has done for us. So there is a blessing associated with this. So do, make sure you partake of it. A uh, picture of depending on Jesus for sustenance. Uh, we saw earlier in John the image of the living water that he offered the woman of Samaria. We saw the image of bread from heaven that he, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood and this image of depending on me. I'm the life, I'm the source of life. And so this is an image that Jesus provides our life. He is our life. Another image is the vine and the branches. You know, if we're not connected to the vine, we can't survive as Christians because it's only through him that our life comes. Not independent, but living dependent. And the last one is looking forward to feasting with Jesus in glory. Revelation chapter 19 verse 9, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus talks about eating the meal with the disciples again in, the, in his kingdom. And this is a picture. Old Testament prophecies are full of, of, of these pictures of this amazing feast with God. And this is a picture of heaven. And we're, what we do by taking it, we're actually like bringing that event back in time to us now so that we can appreciate by faith some of what will happen then. So those are seven reasons that we, we break bread together. Seven things that we can take from it and each of these is vitally important and we, we could spend a sermon on each of these but I'm going to particularly focus on point three this time. So our plan then is uh, Seven reasons for breaking bread, which we've just done, then the importance of shared meals, and then one body in Christ. So what comes up when you look at this image? This is a historic photograph from, I think, 1916 in the UK. And you look at it, and it looks like, it looks like love. It looks like just innocent love and people are just enjoying one another. And, uh, and that's something that's wired into us. In ancient times, uh, there were shared meals. And uh, that was partly, it was very strongly a symbol of friendship. When you ate with somebody, it was a symbol of a friendship and unity with them. 
particularly when you made an agreement with them, which we call a covenant, part of that agreement would be eating together in what is called the covenant meal. The two parties eat together as a symbol of the agreement they'd made. It's like we would sign a document, but then they didn't sign a document, they ate together. That was such an important thing in their culture that to eat with somebody was to express the fact that you had agreement with them. There's some remarkable shared meals in the Old Testament. Uh, in Exodus 12, of course, we have the Passover meal, which I mentioned. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And this was to remember what God had done for them at this time, as they were freed from slavery in Egypt. And uh, it was it was um, this act of remembering. Um, but then we have another event, which is a supernatural meal, which is quite remarkable. Um, in Exodus 24, after God had made the covenant formally with the people, with the Ten Commandments and all the laws, we have this event. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. And so in God's presence, there was this meal which symbolized the covenant. So we're going through history from ancient times, and we're going to take a big jump now to the time of Jesus. Jesus frequently ate with members of society who were despised and rejected as unclean. And we're going to look at this example here. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, he said to him, and he got up and followed him. As Jesus was having a meal in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. So what cultural connotation did that have? When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So we can see a very strong significance attached to this. He was expressing unity with them by doing this. Um, a very powerful idea. And so what we see in the breaking bread is that Jesus himself is actually with us as we break bread together. He's actually said, I'll be present with you. And so it's him with us at this time. So let's move on from Jesus to the early church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. A lot of needs at, at that time because a lot of people had traveled to Jerusalem for this feast and they wanted to stay in here, be taught before they went home. So there was a lot of need for food. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And so you see the close connection with breaking bread and this spirit of unity, which was so impressive to the community at that time, the, uh, the, the, uh, the people in the city. A um, hundred years after Christ, we have an amazing letter written from a Roman governor, Pliny. 
and he wrote to the Emperor Trajan and he had a problem because he wanted to know, know what to do about these Christians because they were doing something very strange. So he wrote to, them for, to, to him for advice. In, this is an extract from the letter. It was their custom to disperse and come together again to partake of food. And so he investigated the food. What are they eating? It's of an ordinary and harmless kind. What's he to do with these Christians who are eating together? And <laughs> that's the biggest thing he can say against them. But the interesting thing is that is what these people are known for. They're known for eating together. And in that culture, that would be expressing unity together. So even the Roman governor was knew about this and was surprised and impressed by this. Now I want to come right up today. Uh, today there's new science which actually supports the why this happens, when we, why eating together is important. And we don't do it because of the science, but the, it's interesting the science is caught up with the, the Bible. So there's something called the vagus nerve which connects the brain to the whole body and particularly relates, regulates our stress levels, our relaxation, and it regulates also our social interaction. Um, you know, are we in danger mode or are we relaxed and open? And it's been found that the process of eating makes our bodies send a message to our brains to be more open to social interaction. Isn't that interesting? So you could say that meals put our brains into social mode. That's wonderful, I just love that. So going back to our plan now, we've looked at the seven reasons and I've talked about the importance of shared meals throughout history. Now I'd like to talk about one body in Christ. Well, let's go back to the prayer in John 17. As we come to the end of the prayer, Jesus prays, The glory you gave to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, and here's the, here's the, the, the purpose, so that the world will know that you sent me. And so our unity as a group of believers is not just something that's nice, something that's happy. It is actually core to the gospel message. It is the means by which the world will know that Jesus was sent by God and we carry him in us. And this key idea is in the breaking of bread. Let's look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? That's the same word as communion. The, bre the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so the idea is here is a unity. So I want to ask then what went wrong in Corinth? There was a major problem in Corinth. And we're going to read these verses, which I think are very important for today's message. So 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to look at verses 17 onwards. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the, for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So the way you do it means there's not, you know, Jesus wouldn't even own it as his supper. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. This, by the way, is the reason why we as a church believe we should all eat together 
and drink together because here it's very key that that symbolism of not one person going ahead of another but doing it together mirrors the unity of the body and so by doing it together we are emphasizing our unity so one goes hungry another goes drunk uh, do you not have houses to eat and drink in in other words, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? So, uh, some people were so poor they didn't have any food. Other people had lots of food and, you know, they could have banquets. And he says, if you're going to have a banquet, you know, have it in your own house. Don't, don't humiliate other people who don't have anything. Um, and also, by implication, you should be sharing your food together so that everybody has food. So you should be celebrating unity here, not disunity. Um, what shall I say to you? Um, shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So, the last verses. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now before I read the last bit there is a, there have been some horrible misunderstandings about these verses through church history. It's quite clear that it's the manner that, of eating that Jesus is talking about here. They're eating in a way that's unworthy of what they're doing. He's not saying that they themselves are not worthy of Jesus' body and blood. That would be ridiculous because none of us are worthy. Um, and then it says, let a person examine himself. Well, Examine himself means to say, you know, is there disunity in me? Am I really understand the unity that's here? Am I really, uh, am I in what I'm doing representing unity or disunity? This is the key thing. But what's happened in church history is people have said, oh, is there any sin in me? Because if there's sin, I'm not worthy to, to, to come to this event. And so I've got to have a period of examining myself to check there's no sin in me. Which is just ridiculous because it defeats the whole purpose because it's a celebration that our sins have been washed away. So in what it's, they would be saying is, um, well, in order to be worthy of this celebration, you've got to have no sin. That's what it seems like. Uh, unfortunately, this is still around today. In fact, not that long ago, I got a magazine in the mail and... Um, it, uh, it was a Christian magazine and it had exactly this theology in it. So, um, w however, we have to take this seriously. Something is going on. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. So this is the danger, not discerning the body. This is what he's warning against. Eats and drinks judgment on himself. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is craving food, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Above the other things, I will give direction. About the other things, I'll give direction when I come. So, this is the story that was happening in Corinth at this time. And I think one of the questions that we have to answer is, why was this so serious? Why was this... Um, verse tw 29 here, such a terrible thing to do. And I think the answer for that is because this is cutting at the very heart of what Jesus was praying for in his prayer. It's cutting at the very heart of those verses that we read. Uh, we read, um, 
so that they may be perfectly one, so the world will know that you sent me. This is why Jesus hates it when Christians fight. He hates it when Christians fight because it cuts at the heart of his mission and our mission to demonstrate God's love through our unity. And conversely, I would say if there's one thing Satan loves to do, it is to set Christians against each other. It says in Ephesians 4, 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for, to the devil. He wants to get in and cause division because division is so opposite to what Jesus wants for his church. And so this is not a complicated message today, but I think this is such an important message today. It's to get this message, if the church had got this message for the last 2,000 years, the world would be radically different. In many cases we have utterly failed to do this. And I'm not just talking about like on a large scale, but on an individual scale, on a small scale. People have had experiences of congregations with fighting and division and being treated badly. And other people hear about it and they say, Christians are just hypocrites. Look at the way they behave, which is, the, which is why it grieves Jesus so much. So that brings me to the point, what can we do? What can we do? And I'm going to suggest four things here, and then I'm going to close by reading 1 Corinthians 13. Galatians 3.28, we read, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. And he's, those aren't the exclusive, the only categories he's interested in. He's used those because any category can be added into here. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the nature of the church. And we should live this out. And particularly in these times when we see so much division. And division in all different categories. Racial division. Division of, of, of uh, poverty or wealth. All kinds of division that we see in this society right now. We need to be living this out. We need, need to be demonstrating a unity in our lives on, a, on, a, on an individual level which people can see and they can see it's authentic and they can, they can be impacted by the love of God that they see in us. Be slow to anger and do not judge the heart. That was the verse we had before, be, be slow to anger. I would say don't judge the heart. Um, this is key to a lot of the fighting that happens, is we don't assume good intentions. You know, it's one thing to disagree with another person, and that's fine. But it's another thing to say, you are bad. You are evil. You, have ba you, are, you are saying that because dot, 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 which we can't tell. Only God knows what's going on. And this is a critical difference to make that we don't judge other people's motives, we don't judge other people's reasons. We can say, I don't agree with you, I think what you're saying is completely wrong, but that's different to saying, you're saying it because you're, a fill you're filled with hate. And Christians have to model how we can have disagreements, yet be in love. And so, be in, 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 do these things in love. And so, don't assume that you know why someone does or says something. And the last one, you may laugh at this, but eat together. Well, you might, in our culture, that, you know, eat together. But actually, it still holds true. And we read that verse from Acts where it said the Christians broke bread from house to house. They ate together all the time. And I think we need to do more of this. We need to do more of just eating together. It could be, you know, it could be in a restaurant if you don't, if you can't invite people to your home, you could like go out for a, a snack or something like that. It's not 
a big thing. It could be just having coffee together. But this is so important because it still does something when we eat together. It still sends a message when we eat together. And this is why New Life Church has food after every meeting. It's why we do it. And once a month we have a full meal together. We do it because we believe it is so important to follow the words of Jesus and to follow the pan that we're given here. But I would encourage you to try and do this on a, on a, 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 a local level as well. Particularly if you disagree with somebody. Like, if you do, then eat together and that will be, you'll find it much easier to agree with them if you're eating with them. And I'm going to give you one more slide. And this is the famous words from 1 Corinthians 13. And if we were to live by these words, then we would really show the love of God. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. That means you're suffering, like you're, you take, you don't, um, uh, you don't want immediately if somebody does something that you don't think is just to get your own back, you're willing to suffer for the sake of love, um, if that's the right thing to do. Believes all things. That means you're thinking the best of people. You know, you're willing to think, even though you don't agree with what they say, you're willing to believe that they're doing this for the right reasons. Hopes all things. You, you know, you've got hope for people. Endures all things. And so, these are the words I want to leave you with. To live by these words. And I want to say that we can only do this by the supernatural power of God in us. It is a supernatural thing. If it wasn't, then it wouldn't be any good for convincing the world. Because, you know, they could explain it away. This must be done supernaturally. You have to want to do it, but you have to be connected to God's power to do it. And so I want to close just by praying these words for us, that you will be able to live by this in these, these coming days and weeks and months. This will be your story, that you will demonstrate unity in a way that so reflects God's love that people are drawn to find out about this God. So let's pray, shall we? Father, we pray that you would make us a people who are united in love. That we are so for each other, willing to overlook each other's weaknesses, wanting to build each other up, willing to sacrifice for others, thinking of others, esteeming them, better than, our, more important than ourselves, that we may shine your light, your love, into a lost generation. Lord, may we be beacons of your love to a dark world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.